You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. A pastor from the group called Warriors for Christ just filed a federal lawsuit claiming his daughter's rights were violated because she was sent home from a public high school in Tennessee for wearing a shirt that said, homosexuality is a sin. This is a quote from the pastor, Rich Pankowski. My 15-year-old is thrown out of school for the day for wearing this shirt. Hashtag LGBT wants to trample on your hashtag free speech rights while they cry for special rights. Hashtag Warriors for Christ, hashtag pride, hashtag Hashtag homosexuality. Hashtag Bible. Oh my God, how many hashtags are you going to fit in there? The article goes on to say, quote, Principal Richard Melton reasoned that his daughter's shirt was prohibited because its message featured a sexual connotation. Responding to that explanation, Penkowski noted that one of his daughter's teachers has an LGBT pride sticker displayed in his classroom featuring the rainbow colors associated with the LGBT movement, which pushed to make same-sex marriage legal across the U.S. Hemant Mehta commented on this, pointing out that wearing a shirt that said John 316 wouldn't be a problem for students but wearing something that intentionally attacks or invalidates people based on immutable characteristics like race, gender, or sexual orientation is really the core of the problem. This kind of thing isn't always clear-cut legally speaking, so we'll have to see how it plays out. Some of you may not know who Mike Huckabee is. He's a pastor who served as the governor of Arkansas from 1996 to 2007, and he ran for the Republican presidential nomination in 2008 and 2016. His daughter, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, was also Trump's press secretary for a while. Well, he went on something called the Intercessors for America recently. He made an appearance at an event they call the monthly prayer call, where he had this to say, quote, this is very, very crazy kind of stuff we're going through right now. And if people don't recognize it, they may say, well, yeah, but it's a pandemic. But if the government will tell us what we can do during a pandemic and we all follow along and march in line, then when and how long will it be before the government will tell us that we can't continue to meet or sing or pray and a pandemic has nothing to do with it? Please don't think that this is an alarm that doesn't have substance. It does. So there are many fundamental issues today that really matter more than they've ever mattered because you've never had the policies that are directing these two parties, two candidates that are so divergent. And if Christians sit this one out and then one day they say, hey, how come my gifts to the church are not tax exempt? Hey, how come the church is being taxed and we're now having to pay property tax on the church and we can't afford that, so we're going to go out of business? How many things like that start happening? And people will say, well, this is not right. And I'm going to say to them, yeah, you didn't vote. That's why it happened. Oh my God, it's so hard to read something that somebody said verbatim. Like, people just structure their oral arguments differently than their written arguments. And That was just a mess to read. When you're dealing with a massive community of people like we do in the U.S., with around 350 million people, it requires a lot of oversight. It requires politicians and policemen and firefighters and community organizers and legislators and representatives of all types. This massive community of people require roads and bridges and construction and schools and all kinds of shit. That's just how it is. We all live in society. We all benefit from it. We all owe money to the communal pool of funds. Paying taxes is expected. It's a requirement. And I'm personally okay with paying taxes. The government can expect, say, 15% of my money every year. It's pretty much the same for everybody, give or take. Except churches. They don't pay the price for being a part of society. They get to live here for free. They don't have to put anything back. They get to take and take and not contribute anything back. Nothing of value anyways. And as far as Huckabee's claims go, did he really say he thinks Christianity is going to be banned by the U.S. government? Lots of U.S. representatives are Christian nationalists. You could knock me over with a feather if that happened. Besides, nobody wants to stop churches from meeting. Nobody's even suggested that through all of this. We just want them to stop meeting in person. We want them to do it online. I know we aren't necessarily putting our best and brightest in pastors' positions, but I expect some level of critical thought from these people. I guess I was asking too much. Years ago, there was a famous movement in the U.S. called the Satanic Panic. If you're about my age, you probably know of it. 
It started with a woman who claimed to have been subjected to satanic ritual abuse, as she called it. Basically, some people in her life captured her and put her through some satanic rituals. Turns out the entire thing was made up, but it didn't matter. It got pastors across the U.S., including Jehovah's Witnesses, fired up into a blood frenzy over fear of Satanists and their sinister plans for Christians. Well, guess what? We have our very own satanic panic taking place all over again. Frederick Joseph tweeted about an Airbnb location he stayed at last week, which apparently had some strange objects lying around. Here's what he said, quote, we just drove three hours, my eight-year-old brother for a getaway, and the house we arrived at ended up having seemingly satanic items and stuff for witchcraft rituals. We had to leave because my brother and the rest of us were frightened, but Airbnb won't refund me. Do people really believe this shit? Do people really believe people who worship Satan are waiting on the sidelines to capture innocent Christians, perform a ritual, and turn them away from God? This is ridiculous! Apparently the objects were a picture of a topless woman, a spooky Halloween candle, a wind-up toy of a cartoon dog sleeping with a woman, and a small statue of Baphomet from the Church of Satan. But the moment he saw something that pointed towards Satanism, he started seeing it everywhere. A commenter on the thread said the outdoor tub on the property was convenient for bloodletting outside and washing away evidence. What? Bloodletting? You cannot be serious. People turn into complete conspiracy theorists when it comes to religion and politics. It's outrageous. Well, the Church of Satan's official Twitter account responded to the tweet thread with this, quote, The photos in this thread depict thrift store curiosities and hot topic kitsch. Not even evidence of satanic rituals. Sounds like you have an overactive imagination and can't tell the difference between supernatural horror movies and reality. In another tweet, they said, quote, If you aren't comfortable with various personal aesthetics, you should stay at a hotel, not someone's house. Some religious people have to get a grip on their imaginations. This is getting out of hand. This week on the podcast, Pastor Stephen Anderson of NIFB fame, pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church, was banned from YouTube a while back. And not just YouTube, but he was banned from entering the borders of 34 countries, including but not limited to Canada, South Africa, the UK, Jamaica, Ireland, and the Netherlands. I've talked about the NIFB on my main channel before. They are very extreme. They're a very hateful and truly dangerous sect of Christianity. They've called for violent action against more than one group. And that's why I'm okay with deplatforming them, specifically the violence. Well, guess what? He found a way around the YouTube ban. Big surprise. I figured this would happen. You can go to his church's website and find links to the sermons. But the sermons have been appearing on eight different YouTube channels over the past few months. Mostly small channels with almost nothing else to be found. The names of the channels are J. Tan Ken Tor 2000, I Baptist, The Son of Yuri, Daily Baptist, Jonah 32, Serves Flame Zone, and others. This dude is really bad. On Twitter, my bio has a quote from Noam Chomsky. If you don't believe in freedom of expression for those you despise, then you don't believe in it at all. And I stand by that until they start calling for violence. That's where I draw the line. And that's a line Steven Anderson has crossed and continues to cross daily. But that's not where the story ends. Turns out, after Hemant Mehta posted about this on his website, every one of those YouTube channels got deleted, and Anderson is not happy about it. We're going to take a look at what he had to say in response. I've mentioned Pastor John MacArthur on here a couple of times before. Well, he's back in the news. He's been celebrating the fact that he packed a ton of people in his church with no masks for a while now. Well, a judge issued a preliminary injunction against the church. The county permitted the congregation to gather, even indoors, as long as they wore masks and socially distanced. Guess what? They didn't. Here's a quote from the judge. The church is violating various health orders through its indoor worship services. The church's continuing violation constitutes a public nuisance, per se, as the county has no adequate remedy at law. Injunctive relief is warranted to prevent ongoing violations of the various health orders. While the court is mindful that there's no substitute for indoor worship in the spiritual refuge of a sanctuary, the court cannot ignore the county health order, does not dictate a ban on worship. Instead, it provides any worship must take place other than indoors. 
The county health order allows worship to occur outdoors, virtually through the internet, and in any manner that is not indoors with a large gathering of people. This feature of the county health order mitigates, but certainly does not eliminate, the harm that will be suffered by the church congregants through restricting their indoor worship. Like the Court of Appeal, when considering the stay, the court finds the balance of harms tips in favor of the county. I'm not religious, obviously, but maybe that's why I don't get why this is such a massive fucking problem problem for people. Why is it so fucking hard to hold services outside? Why is that so hard? I don't understand. What are you gaining by holding it inside? Other than COVID-19, they just want to be contrary at the expense of people's lives. That's it. And for the record, he said he's ignoring the orders anyways. I hope these churches are fined out of existence for what they've done by making this public hardship even harder for everybody. Before we take a look at all that, let's listen to some voicemails. Don't forget, if you want to call in and leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Delilah, and I live in Indiana. I was born in in uh, 1960 as, you know, to the JWs, and I can associate with what you talk about, post-traumatic stress or the, what you call the uh, religious part. But anyway, um, it's been a lifelong horribleness that I can't, you know, shake. It just ruined my uh, sense of me. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things. But uh, the crowning blow was when I found my mother. It, it was a terrible death. Uh, living with my brother, she had died and she was mummified. I, it's so hard to even talk about. And... The witnesses ran as fast as they could run, and that was like the really end for me. And all the years I think back of the trauma. Anyway, thank you. Bye. Yeah, there's uh, there's something called religious trauma syndrome. I, I talked about it a few weeks ago. I think that's what this voicemail was referencing. At the time, I was talking about how it's linked to post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's the definition. Religious trauma syndrome, RTS, is a group of symptoms that arise in response to traumatic or stressful religious experiences. Uh, it comes along with a lot of symptoms that are very similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, including confusing thoughts and reduced ability to think critically, negative beliefs about oneself, others in the world, trouble making decisions, feeling depression, anxiety, grief, anger, lethargy, a sense of feeling lost or directionless and alone, a lack of pleasure or interest in things you used to enjoy, a loss of a community, family, friends, romantic relationships, feeling behind the times with cultural happenings, and many other symptoms of PTSD, including nightmares, flashbacks, dissociation, emotional difficulty, etc. I don't know about anybody else in my audience. I'm sure at least a few of you guys, but I have, at least at some point in my life, had all of these. Um, right now, I'm struggling the most with nightmares. I have constant well, not constant. I have the occasional nightmare about Jehovah's Witnesses. Usually, it's a nightmare about me showing up at the Kingdom Hall and being shunned by everybody there. It's some form of that, or being shunned by somebody on the street who's a Jehovah's Witness. Something like that. Um, I have had flashbacks, too, where... I'll just be going about my day and some little thing happens that reminds me so heavily of being a Jehovah's Witness, just this soul-crushing pain that I have to face again. Something happened not long ago on Twitter. There's a Jehovah's Witness on there who's going around proselytizing to people. Actually, they're all over the place on Twitter. And I told them that I was disfellowshipped and they blocked me and continued a conversation with the people around me on my tweet thread, trying to convert them. Um, that, that definitely threw me into a, a flashback slash emotional difficulty type of situation. So I definitely understand where you're coming from, caller, and I appreciate the call, and hopefully we can make it through this type of thing together. Uh, this type of thing that we have been put through needlessly by toxic religions. 
So anyway, good luck, and thank you for the phone call. I'm calling in for con- and this is their message. Hi, I wanted to ask about Jehovah's Witnesses allowing non-witnesses into their homes, mainly because once I was allowed over to my JW friend's house, so when I was there, it was a really charged attitude with the family. I've always wondered why his mother and father were always watching and some was glaring at me when they had been the ones to let me come over. I also wanted to know why they had allowed me over to then just seem upset at me while I was there, just wondering if this was a whole church thing. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, my guess about what happened is there was probably disagreement between the two parents on whether or not you should be allowed to come over. Um, I've talked about this on my channel before, but Jehovah's Witnesses are not really big fans of having outsiders as friends. They don't think that children should have friends that are not Jehovah's Witnesses, generally. It varies from family to family. You won't be disfellowshipped for it, but it's heavily frowned upon, and you will... Uh, you risk becoming a pariah among the Jehovah's Witnesses in the congregation if you do decide to have an outsider as a friend. So my guess is there was disagreement between the two parents. One of them was like, oh, it's fine, just let him have a friend. And the other was like, no, that's not good, that's evil, you're straying from Jehovah, I don't like that, so on and so forth. If I had to guess, I would say the dad was probably fine with having the friend, the worldly friend, because men have the final say in the religion, always. They are the head of the family, and they make the final decisions. So I'm guessing the man probably decided to let the kid have the friend, and the mother wasn't happy about that. So now both parents are watching to see what happens. Watch to see if you're like possessed by Satan or if you're going to do something evil that's unacceptable and you won't be allowed over there anymore or any of that other stuff. That's my guess. I hope that eventually those people found their way out of the religion. Um, high hopes, I know, but I'm glad you didn't get sucked in by proxy anyways. Thank you for the voicemail. I appreciate that. Calling in for uh, Tony. Hello, Telltale. I'm Tony from Spain. I'm through a wonderful member of your Discord. I want to thank you for everything you do. Now my question. Do you think that all religions would develop cult-like behavior if allowed? Spain is a deeply Catholic ca country, and I feel that Catholicism here exhibits many of the things the bite model measures, uh, especially in rural communities. Thanks, and please, set up some way for us to leave your voicemail with having to bother your wonderful Discord members. You can actually call through like Skype or whatever. I didn't, I, I, it broke up a little bit there, but I suspect you were saying have it so that international callers can call it. I think if you call through Skype, then you can probably do it internationally. I'm not really sure, but um, I do pay for the minutes. So it, it costs me every month, every time people like call or whatever, which is 100% worth it. I'm, so glad I have this voicemail system. Would not trade it for the world. And I'd pay 15 times what I'm paying for it right now just to have this system. But um, I imagine that the voicemail system probably limits it to domestic callers because it would be insanely expensive if it allowed international callers. Uh, plus, international callers can use Skype anyways to call pseudo-domestically, I believe. Anyway, to the question. Uh, let me play this part again. Hang on. Do you think that all religions would develop cult-like behavior if allowed? To answer the question, um, would all religions develop cult-like qualities if there weren't, like, basically guardrails? Um, the answer to that, I think, is no, not necessarily. In fact, it's really strange to me that cults all tend to fit this one mold. I mean, it's a fairly broad mold, but you've got very specific things like gaslighting the members, having an us versus them mentality, using singing and, pr and prayer and chanting to put people into almost a meditative trance state, uh, emotional manipulation through shunning and things like that. They're reasonably specific points. And Cults hit these points, like, dead on a lot of the time. It's really, really bizarre. 
I think a lot of religions have the tendency to go down that road unless there's a leader at the top guiding it away from extremism or unless a new leader takes charge and forces basically a reformation. And there are a lot of religions out there who haven't really gone through a reformation, like Islam, for example, and they are off the scale on the bite model in in some of these extreme sects of Islam. So anyway, the point here is I don't think religions will necessarily go down the cult road. I do think it's fascinating that they all kind of flock to the same general tactics to lock people in and prevent them from leaving. But I think that's just the result of an extremist mindset, generally speaking. Not all Christians are extremists. Hello, I am calling in for Fernando. How, if ever, would you attempt to get undercover into a budding social media cult to try and gain information into them, and what precautions would you take? There's an anti-vaxxer, anti-mask-based social media cult that's been rising in popularity, and as a scientist, I'm very concerned about the harm and tactics they use. Given how you're the expert, I thought I would ask. This is Fernando from Spain. I appreciate that. I don't know that I'd call myself an expert. I would call myself a communicator, though. You can call me an expert if you want, but I feel like I haven't gotten a PhD in the field or anything like that. I've been studying it for a very long time, and I watch a whole shitload of information on it, like documentaries, I've read books, and all this other stuff, but I don't have a degree in it, so I don't know. It, I just call myself a communicator. Anyway, to the point, how would I go about infiltrating one of these groups? I think your first step would be to create an identity that is completely clear of your real information. Like, do not put any trace of your real information in it at all. Like, even one thing. Use a VPN so that your IP address does not trace back to you. Make up a backstory and a fake name for yourself. Make up a full-blown backstory for yourself that's close to the truth, but not exact. Don't give out any personal information that could be used to trace back to you don't talk about what you do for work or don't don't reveal the real thing that you do for work at the very least um don't post any pictures or or anything like that level one cults are the ones that i think that you'd be talking about which is like decentralized non-focused cults like anti-vax or or whatever else In most cases, when you're dealing with a cult like that, a lot of it is laid bare anyways. It's uh, it's usually taking place on a public platform like Facebook or Twitter or something. Sometimes it's taking place in a more private sector like Telegram or, or Discord or something like that. So you may not even have to infiltrate or sneak around or interact with them in any way it's possible that you may be able to just kind of peruse and browse and just give the minimal information needed to just get into these extra sections, these extra channels, um, or these extra pages to kind of see what, what's being said there. But if you do have to give extra information or if they want you to engage more before trusting you fully, start spreading some of the propaganda around in that group. Don't spread it around anywhere else if you can help it because you want to keep it as contained as possible. Try to raise your level within the hierarchy, if you will, by giving them progressively more extreme things so they start to trust you more. And who knows, maybe they'll open up and let you into extra Discord channels or something that you didn't have access to before. Good luck and be careful. And like I said, use a VPN. Don't use any of your real information. Any. Even if you don't think it's important or relevant, you would be fucking surprised what somebody can use to get your real identity. Give as little personal information that's real as possible. What's up, Owen? This is Fred from Colorado. Um, I'm calling because I have a little bit of a problem. As you know, uh, we have Mormons in my state, 
quite a few of them where I'm at. And I've been friends with many Mormons up through high school. The issue I'm having is that it's becoming very difficult to maintain friendships with my Mormon friends as we're growing up. Because whereas my other friends are growing and maturing and leaving the nest and growing up, getting jobs and promotions, working at new places, uh, my Mormon friends are just kind of stuck where they're at, really. I mean, it seems like they're emotionally stunted. And whenever I try to broach the subject, uh, they get very, very violent and, off and offended. And I was wondering if you had any advice to just peacefully coexist, like not even get confrontational, just peacefully exist with any cult member. Any advice you could give on the topic would be very appreciated. Bye-bye. I would tell you to consider this. What is the one thing that every cult member is obsessed with? The one thing every cult member is obsessed with bringing more people into the cult. That's what they want in basically every single situation. If you want to peacefully coexist, then you have to put up a front of maybe faux interest in what they have to say. Ask them questions about the group. Try to get them to talk about it, because that is the one thing they absolutely love to talk about. Obviously, they are completely obsessed with the cult, or it wouldn't be a cult. If you want to peacefully coexist with cult members, that means that you are going to find yourself in a really shitty situation. It's not fun to deal with cult members on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not fun to deal with cult members on a minute-by-minute -minute basis sometimes. So the trick may just be to feign interest in the group, to try to get them to drop their guard so that they don't feel like they're always on the defensive, and put on a show of genuine interest, even if it isn't genuine, to try to get them to cool down and be more open to talking with you about normal subjects. But something you're going to have to realize is, unfortunately, there isn't really much of a normal conversation to be had with cult members. Their entire lives revolve around this group. I, I think you said Mormonism in your, one, in your specific case. Uh, but this kind of applies in any case with cults. Their entire lives revolve around the cult, the goings-on with the cult, the speakers at the meetings, the things that they, the leaders had to say, it revolves around the cult their entire lives. So you may just have to fake interest in the cult if you want to get along with them and work with them. Anyway, good luck. It doesn't sound like a fun situation, but that's my best advice. Until we finally manage to help people find their way out of these groups, that may be our only option. The biggest of Chungai. The one downside to modern medicine is that people stupid enough to ignore quarantine have a pretty big chance to be this stupid and still survive without natural selection rightfully removing them. Yeah, I agree. Unfortunately, I don't want to see anybody die. I would love to live in a world where, you know, nobody died. I don't want anybody to die. There's a book called Incognito, The Secret Lives of the Brain. I read that book years and years ago, before, maybe right around the time when I was exiting Jehovah's Witnesses. My ex-brother-in-law got it for me on Audible as a gift. Uh, the one that helped me exit Jehovah's Witnesses, he got that book for me. And he also gave me his copy of Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen Hassan. So this book, Incognito, Secret Lives of the Brain talks about the case where there was a bell tower shooter, I believe, or a clock tower shooter. Um, the guy was fairly well-rounded. He was a nice guy. He was a part of the community and everything until one day he goes up to this clock tower with a rifle and just takes out everybody from the top of the tower. And nobody understood what happened. Nobody understood why this was taking place. What broke in him? What changed? What snapped? And they opened his brain to find 
a large tumor sitting on the impulse control part of his brain. If that hadn't been there, then that wouldn't have happened. There's another story of a guy who was living a perfectly normal life. He loved his mother-in-law and his father-in-law, loved them, loved his wife, loved his family. One day, he drove to their house and killed them, his, his parents-in-law, and wrote a note saying, please study my brain so that you can figure out why this happened to me so it doesn't happen to anybody else. And again, they found a tumor. Ultimately, free will is a religious concept, not a scientific concept. If you understand somebody's life path, they were exposed to crack in utero, for example, grew up in a bad neighborhood, mistreated by their families, by their parents, by their single mother, mistreated terribly, and grew up to have no chance, no chance at life, had no idea how to even get into college, wasn't even on their radar, didn't have the money for it, didn't have the money for food when they were 12, so they fell into a gang so that they could eat. Can you blame that person for what they had to do to survive? You really can't. You can't blame them for that stuff. You can't blame the guy for killing his parents-in-law when there was a tumor pressing on the impulse section of his brain. He loved them. He had no choice. It was out of his hands. It wasn't a free will, I'm choosing to do this kind of thing. When you start to study the brain and how it works, you start to realize that the decisions that people make aren't really decisions. They are almost predetermined in some ways. You guys should definitely read the book, Incognito Secret Lives of the Brain. The writer, David Eagleman, had this laboratory set up where he would have a clock, basically, that would flash random numbers and letters on the screen. And he would sit people down and he'd tell them, watch that clock, and the very moment that you decide to raise either your left hand or your right hand, remember what, which number was on the screen at that moment, and then raise your hand. He also had them hooked up to some machinery to detect different patterns in their brain and things like that. He discovered that the decision was made up to five seconds earlier than they consciously knew that it was made. If they were going to raise their left hand, there was a part of their brain that lit up that he could watch light up five seconds before they knew which one they were going to raise. Your decisions are not boiled down to free will as much as you think they are. So I have sympathy for people like Trump supporters and super spreaders, people that, that genuinely want to spread the virus, because everyone is a hero of their own stories. They all believe that what they're doing is the right thing, unless there's some serious mental condition like psychopathy or, or sociopathy or something. The vast majority of people believe they're doing the right thing. So I hesitate to say natural selection isn't acting on these people. I don't want anybody to die. I want them to get better. I want people to get better. Bud123, my nightmares are usually about conflict. Maybe our nightmares reflect our past and things we never made peace to. Nightmares are not always a sign of post-traumatic stress disorder, but can be a sign of it. 
and my nightmares are the result of post-traumatic stress disorder, not just linked to the religion, but linked to my childhood. My dad was pretty physically abusive, so I have nightmares as a result of that, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have PTSD. I'm not sure if you do or not. Anyway, I hope you get over those nightmares. Those nightmares fucking suck, man, for real. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to cover Steven Anderson trying to evade YouTube's ban and failing miserably. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The first article I wanted to take a look at is entitled, YouTube Finally Took Down the Channels of Christian Hate Pastor Steven Anderson. This is by Hemant Mehta on the Friendly Atheist website. So let's give the article a read and see what it has to say. I got Christian hate preacher Steven Anderson banned from YouTube. A few days ago, I posted about how the leader of Arizona's new independent fundamentalist Baptist Faithful Word Baptist Church had been posting his recent sermons on a variety of smaller YouTube channels or having his followers post them for him to get around the ban that YouTube had placed on his own page. How did he get banned? Anderson has celebrated the deaths of murdered LGBTQ people, called on the government to execute homosexuals, spread Holocaust denialism, promoted misogyny, and more. His sermons are so outrageously awful that 34 countries won't allow him to step foot within their borders. I would say he's one of the most violent and vicious um, and most public pastors out there. I'm sure that there are others that are more violent and vicious than he is, but um, they're they're not anywhere near as public as he is. His old YouTube channel was at 125,000 subscribers, I think, when it was removed. And it was growing. It was growing. I remember watching it hit 100K, and then 110K, 120K. It's, it was creeping on 130K before YouTube removed it. I don't believe in censoring speech. I don't believe in it, period. Until you cross the line into serious violence. Until you cross the line into encouraging violence. That's my line. And that's actually, in a lot of ways, that's a U.S. government's line, too. You can't uh, endorse behavior that would cause direct harm to somebody. Things like that. Uh, This guy got as close to the law as he possibly could. He may have even crossed the line in some cases. I don't know. I don't know the law. But he was a really, really awful person. And in that specific case, when he's, you know, outright endorsing violence like that and telling his members that he wishes that this would happen to them, um, that I'm okay with him being removed at that point. Now, as far as the YouTube ban goes, they removed his channel, like I said, about 125,000 subscribers on it when it was removed. I remember this issue coming up years and years ago with a YouTuber named uh, Keemstar, I think. I don't really, I never watched the guy. I didn't know anything about him or whatever. If you guys remember him, then shout out to Keemstar, I guess. His channel was actually removed. He's like in the millions. I believe he had a channel called Drama Alert or something, and he was banned from YouTube. Now, this is years and years ago. He circumvented the ban by basically having somebody else create a channel and he became the host of that channel. So it wasn't his YouTube channel. He was just starring on it, basically. And as a result of that, basically, circumvention, YouTube changed their rules so that their face can no longer appear on the website anymore. I don't know if that's still the case. I don't know if they've changed it again or or any of that stuff. That may not even be the rules currently on YouTube, but it used to be. Uh, So it doesn't surprise me at all to learn that YouTube removed these eight channels of Steven Anderson's sermons, even though they hadn't directly violated any TOS stuff or anything. 
just having Steven Anderson's face on YouTube is enough to get the video removed um, for violating this thing or that thing. Now, I, I'm going to play a video of him later, and it's a little bit of a risk, but I think it's fine. I've played video of Alex Jones in the past, and you know he's banned from YouTube, so I think it's going to be fine. I'm criticizing. I am not endorsing or or giving him a platform to speak. And like I said, that may not even be the rule anymore. I haven't checked lately. Anyway, let's continue reading. More recently, he began spreading misinformation about COVID, even urging his congregation and YouTube viewers against taking any eventual vaccine. Oh, he's an anti-vaxxer. Am I surprised? Not really. In July, his primary method of spreading his message, his YouTube channel, was permanently shut down due to violations of the website's policies. The COVID stuff may have finally tipped the scales. But Anderson responded by saying he'd start new channels without explicitly mentioning his church's name or his name in their descriptions. In other words, you wouldn't be able to find his sermons through a YouTube search, but his followers would know exactly where to go. There's just one snag in that logic. He thrives on new followers, and they would need a starting point. For that, he used his church's website. Every archived sermon on the site comes with a YouTube link. Most churches that post their sermons online direct people to a single channel. It's a good way to build a brand. But Anderson no longer had that option. So his sermons all went to different places. It got so complicated, I had to create a spreadsheet to keep track of everything. Bottom line, the past two full months worth of sermons were posted on about a dozen different channels, some of which had only a few other videos and a few subscribers. Other channels had already been deleted. Only a couple of them made any direct reference to Anderson at all. It was sneaky. It was also a lot of work, but Anderson didn't have much of a choice. Where else would he go? I'll tell you where he could go. There's this, it's called a content management system called WordPress. Super common in like the web development world. Like a lot of people will use WordPress to like build a full blown website really quickly and easily, right? Well, I have used WordPress in the past for my website. They have plugins that you can install on your website. And there's this Dropbox plugin that lets you basically put a video in a Dropbox account or a Google Drive account or whatever and play it directly on your website streaming from Dropbox or from Google Drive. He could have done that. He wouldn't have had to have used a streaming service like YouTube or any of that stuff. He could have just used Google Drive or whatever. I I'm really not sure why. Do they not have like tech people around to handle this stuff? Why are they still fucking around with YouTube? Like YouTube has banned you. Just move on with your lives. It was sneaky. It was also a lot of work but Anderson didn't have much of a choice. Where else would he go? Sure, there are other websites that'll host his content, but if he wants strangers to find him, he has to be where the video action is at. That's YouTube. It's the same way conservatives constantly complain about Twitter's supposed censorship and urge their followers to go to smaller alternatives like Parler. Isn't there another one? What's the other one called? Gab? I think it's called Gab. Parler or Gab. Only to watch those rebellions fizzle out. They eventually realize that it's no fun speaking in an echo chamber. Even the haters want to be where everyone else is at. That's true. It's like TikTok right now. Like TikTok is exploding. You can create a TikTok channel and have tens of thousands of followers within like such a short amount of time. But TikTok has its own drawbacks. For example, um, the videos can only be like a certain length of time, like a couple of minutes long or something, I think. And it's just not really suited for the same style of videos that you usually find on YouTube. That's one of the downsides to TikTok. And that's why I haven't created a TikTok. Also, there's a massive problem with TikTok right now that people aren't talking about. You guys remember forever ago when you... Well, not even that long ago. You guys remember recently when YouTube was dealing with that whole FCC thing where there were children on the platform, like under 13 people on the platform, and YouTube openly said that they knew that there were children on the platform, and the FCC, like, no, it, maybe it was the FTC, yeah, and the FTC sued the shit out of them, got like hundreds of millions of dollars out of YouTube and fines and all that other stuff. TikTok has not thought this through yet because they haven't gone through that battle. 
and they have allowed basically anybody on the platform. Uh, that's probably part of the reason why there are so many people on TikTok right now. Kids are just flooding it. And that is a poisoned chalice. That's a poisoned chalice. TikTok is going to go down hard when it finally does. Unfortunately, I hate to see social media platforms fail like this, but they're not following the rules. And this rule just so happens to be the type that sinks major companies. That's why Microsoft was in talks to buy them and then backed out. Uh, Microsoft supposedly is now in talks to buy TikTok uh, along with Netflix, like Netflix and Microsoft are talking about buying TikTok. But honestly, I think TikTok's just going to have to like face the music and, you know, fail miserably because they haven't been following U.S. rules about having children on the platform this whole time. So anyway, got a little bit sidetracked there. Let's continue reading. Since I posted all about that earlier this week, it looks like every one of those newer YouTube channels has been deleted. If you visit those pages, they now say this account has been terminated for a violation of YouTube's terms of service. So long, J Tankentor 2000, and then he lists all of the channels that, that were deleted. The best part about it, Anderson is angry. On Wednesday night, he delivered another sermon, and yes, he live streamed it on YouTube. How do you do that? He used a seemingly innocuous channel called Singing Baptist, which was created on July 30th of this year. Until this week, the channel had no other sermons, just clips of Anderson's church members singing before he speaks, along with the lyrics on the screen. Nothing controversial. During that sermon, he lashed out against YouTube and suggested God should use the wildfires currently ravaging the West Coast and aim them directly at YouTube's headquarters. I have this video. I downloaded a copy of it. So let's give it a watch. It's too bad that this message about the love of God is struggling to find its way on YouTube. It's pretty sad when my wife has to call me before the service and say, what, where's the channel? I can't find it. Because YouTube has been deleting our channel. It's not her fault. YouTube is deleting our channel. Like every week, every day. You know, meanwhile, Insane Clown Posse's channel is doing fine. Okay? And, and think about the vile and the filth and the garbage that's on that kind of stuff. You know the funniest part about this to me? The fact that Insane Clown Posse is crazy about Jesus. They are Jesus freaks, those dudes are. They made a song a while back called, um, I call it Magnets. That's not the name of it. It's called Miracles. That's what it is. It's called Miracles. And in the song, hang on. I need to look up the lyrics to this before we continue on. Let me look up the lyrics. I'm, I'm going to pull the lyrics out. It's fucking hilarious and sad at the same time. So this, these are the lyrics. Water, fire, air, and dirt. Fucking magnets. How do they work? And I don't want to talk to a scientist. Y'all motherfuckers lying and getting me pissed. It's the cringiest shit ever. Oh my God, it's so cringy. I can't stand it. I can't stand to even read it. It was so bad. So anyway, you guys should go listen to the song Magnet. I'm sorry, goddammit. You should go listen to the song Miracles by Insane Clown Posse if you haven't heard it. It is so fucking cringy. Uh, there's a lot cringy about those guys, but I'm not going to get into it right now. Let's continue on listening to Steven Anderson talk shit about an Insane Clown Posse. And think about the vile and the filth and the garbage that's on that kind of stuff. I mean, you think Insane Clown Posse is a little bit of, of filth? A little bit hateful? A little bit... Uh, Look who's talking about being hateful. Isn't that interesting? This guy has zero self-awareness. Zero self-awareness right now. After the hateful shit he says. But his hatefulness is okay because God told him it's okay, right? Well, guess what? Insane Clown Posse told, uh, was told by God that their hatefulness was okay, too. Anybody can say that. God told me that my hatefulness is okay. We have certain rules in society because we have to go into every situation assuming that we might be wrong. We have to assume we could be. There is a possibility, no matter how sure we are, that maybe we're wrong. And for that reason, we have to 
go into every situation affording certain uh what's the word i'm looking for here we have to go into every situation granting certain concessions to the people that we're debating or discussing something with we have to grant concessions and we have to we and we should be able to expect those concessions granted to us too maybe i'm wrong about anything i could be wrong about literally every single thing that i think that i know Going into a conversation realizing that changes your disposition toward the world, toward every conversation that you ever have, and it makes it less likely that you're going to end up with this guy's mindset, with this kind of mindset. My hatefulness is okay because I know I'm right, but his hatefulness isn't okay because I know he's wrong. That leads to absurdity. It's illogical. You have to understand maybe you're wrong. And for that reason, hatefulness should be counted out completely. We should be able to have calm, honest discussions about any subject, about anything, and leave the hatefulness out of it. You know what? But that's okay because it's not Jesus Christ and the Word of God that's being preached. Nobody gives a shit if you're talking about Jesus. Nobody fucking cares. Talk about Jesus as much as you want. I'm talking about Jesus. We can all talk about Jesus. That's not the problem here. The problem is the hatefulness. Truth is hate to those who hate the truth. And right now, you know, uh, YouTube has just banned me and just deleting my channels one after the other. You know, it's just I make a new channel, it gets deleted. I keep respawning. Every time I die, I, I, I'm, I've got, I'm not, I don't have nine lives. I just keep coming back, keep respawning. Okay, does he think his audience gets that joke? Does he think they play video games? No, they're so immersed in Jesus, they don't have time for video games. Like, who in his audience would understand that reference? Are video games even acceptable in his, like, in his church? Maybe the ones where you're, uh, you know, running around shooting people, like, um... I'm trying to word this in a very specific way. Maybe games like Call of Duty. This guy is completely unhinged from reality. Again and again, they cannot stop us from preaching the word of God. But anyway. All right, before we continue, I just want to make one more point here. Um, the fact is he was banned from YouTube. That's, that's a fact. That's just what it is. He was banned from YouTube. Now, his next steps are... Twofold. Move on. Part one. Move on with your life. And part two. File a lawsuit if you feel like it was uh, unfair. File an appeal. Try to take legal steps or appeal to the company or whatever if you feel like it was unfair. While that's happening, you should fucking move on. It's over. If I was banned from YouTube, I would appeal to the highest levels I possibly could. Absolute highest levels. But I'll tell you this. I seriously doubt. I would bet money that I'm never going to be banned from YouTube because I follow their rules. I understand that there are rules, and I understand why there are rules, and I follow them, and I find a way to communicate my message while following the rules. I don't feel like my message has fundamentally been dulled by YouTube. I've had to change some of the words I use. I've had to use euphemisms here and there. But I can always communicate my point. If you're incapable of communicating your point on YouTube um, because of some restrictions, then I feel like that might partially be because you're a bad communicator. Uh, There are some situations in which you have to talk about a tough subject and that's not advertiser friendly like for example the holocaust um i can imagine a situation in which i would feel obligated to talk about the holocaust at length and i would have to use words that are not ad- advertiser friendly in that case i would do it i would use those words that i felt i needed to use and i'd just let it get demonetized but for the most part if you are having serious issues communicating your point on youtube I'm going to chalk it up to your communication problems more than the advertiser guidelines, as they are at this immediate moment. 
that could change in the future. But I've worked around the guidelines just fine up to this point. I've been on the platform for five years. So I feel like this guy's just making excuses. Maybe all maybe the fact that California is going up in flames right now. Maybe the, maybe maybe God can just go like and maybe it can hit Mountain View, California and torch old YouTube's headquarters. Torch old Google's headquarters, right? It's too bad. That's all this guy understands. That's all he understands. Anger, hatred, and violence. That's it. He looks to solve every problem that he ever has with violence. He tries to solve every problem he has with violence. And if he can't personally do it because he doesn't want to go to jail, he has voiced his opinion loudly that he would be willing to, but he thinks that God still needs him as a preacher rather than sitting in prison. So he's going to openly tell his congregants that he wants this to happen i don't know if you guys have ever heard of stochastic terrorism god i'm gonna have a lot of words to blank out but the definition of stochastic terrorism the public demonization of a person or group resulting in the incitement of a violent act which is statistically probable but whose specifics cannot be predicted the lone wolf attack was apparently influenced by the rhetoric of stochastic terrorism an example of stochastic terrorism would be like Donald Trump just talking mad shit about Hillary and saying that Hillary should be locked up and she's evil and she's doing all this stuff. She's doing all this crazy evil stuff. She's trying to take your wife and take your kids and take your husband. And statistically, Trump has, what, 80 million followers on Twitter, right? If he's saying this stuff to an audience of 80 million people, say... 20 million of those people are Donald Trump fans, like diehard fans. Say half a percent of those 20 million people have genuine mental problems, like they have psychopathy. They have been clinically diagnosed with psychopathy, right? They're psychopaths. 0.1% of those 20 million. That means how many people Thousands, is it thousands of people have psychopathy and believe that Hillary Clinton is evil and something needs to be done about it and don't care about themselves or anything else in their lives. They're ready to do something about it. That's the idea behind stochastic terrorism. The idea that Donald Trump didn't specifically tell somebody to go blah, 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 but when you're speaking to an audience of 20 million people or 80 million or whatever, statistically speaking, it's going to happen. That's why when you're a public figure, the way you speak is so fucking important. You have to be careful not to even hint at the idea that you would be accepting of something like this. And that's why somebody like Steven Anderson just coming out and saying it like that is scary and dangerous. And for that reason, because he's crossed the line into endorsing violence, I am in favor of him being removed from YouTube. That's my line. I believe in freedom of expression. If you don't believe in freedom of expression for those who you despise, then you don't believe in it at all. This isn't about despising him. This is about him outright saying he wants something violent to happen to certain people. That's just an unacceptable level of rhetoric in my eyes. There's my line. Take it or leave it. Let me read some super chats real quick. Life in the doghouse. Love that Huckabee just outright called the church a business. Lamau. Uh, I agree. Yeah, I noticed that too in the opening. Huckabee basically just said this business is closing. Well, guess what? This business is one of the few that doesn't have to pay taxes. And that just doesn't sit right with me. 
Lucifer Lafleur. I usually work during the podcast. So glad I can be here to support it today. You're always spot on and help so many. Keep it up. Hail thyself. Thanks. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you for coming. It's always interesting to see you come in and, and read what you have to say. The biggest of Chungai. It's kind of scary knowing people as stupid and or evil as Anderson have managed to get their sycophants into public offices and amass power using stubble methods peddling the same hate. Yeah. It is disturbing how many people in Congress are like Christian nationalists and extremely hateful. It's very disturbing. I wish we could get these people out of it so much, but there's only so much we can do, you know? Just keep working at it. Just keep fighting. Liana Giorma. I'm originally from Romania. Grew up as Romanian Christian Orthodox. Luckily, I moved to California when I was 13, 15 years ago. Now I'm atheist. The Romanian Christian Orthodox Church is more corrupt than any American ones. It's a tall claim. It's a tall claim. Well, either way, um, I think that it's preferable to believe only true things versus believing things that may not be true. And in that sense, I think that religion, generally speaking, is a harmful force in society because I would rather people believe true things rather than false things. Lucifer LeFleur, JWs are taught to hate. Most ex-JWs I know who make it all the way out are not full of hate. I'm sure this is true of all people, religious or not. Yeah. I've noticed, though, that Jehovah's Witnesses who make it out, they tend to be, uh, sometimes, sometimes they can be really toxic. I think that's partly because there's, like, nothing to do but gossip when you're a Jehovah's Witness. I'm sure you did your fair share of gossiping. I know I did some gossiping. Everybody gossips when they're Jehovah's Witness and try to tear people down and maybe even in a in an attempt to build them up and make them better Jehovah's Witnesses. And sometimes they carry that mindset out with them. As a result, I think some in the, the ex-Jehovah's Witness community can be pretty toxic. Uh, but generally speaking, I haven't had any bad luck with it. I've just seen what other people have gone through. A lot of ex-JWs come around and they're super chill. Never really had a problem myself. That's where I'm going to end it for the night. Appreciate you guys coming on and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.